All right, well, we're going to launch out into a new study tonight from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, and so I want to encourage you to uh, find that it's right after the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament in that group of prophets that are there, and we're going to start studying about Daniel and his friends that were taken into captivity by the Babylonians around 605 B.C., and of course, it all happened because the children of Israel would not obey the Lord. They refused to honor God with their lives, and God told them, you know, there will be judgment for that. Well, the Babylonians became the judgment. One of the things we know about Babel and Babylon all the way through the scriptures, old and into the New Testament when we get into the Revelation and the end time events, is uh, Babel was that... uh, uh, original city that Nimrod founded back way back in the Old Testament in Genesis when they were going to build a tower to the sky. You remember that story? And the Tower of Babel and God confused their language and caused them to scatter everywhere. And from that moment until later on, you, you, see, you always see a comparison between Jerusalem as God's holy city and where Uh, Jesus is going to rule and reign from and Babylon which ends up being the uh, city that represents the world and represents paganism and represents the culture of the world and the culture of of evil in the world. Well, God allowed Babylon to come in and overtake and besiege uh, Jerusalem and uh, all of uh, the, the nation of Israel to take them or in Judah to take them. Uh, into captivity and Daniel along with other young people because that's who they were after they were after getting the young uh, men and women out and taking them back to Babylon to re-educate them and so the whole goal was to do that and they went after the noble kids and the kids that were of of uh, godly families and Daniel was from that group he came from a what we would call today a well-to-do family. He knew the scriptures. He had been taught. He had been been schooled. And he was taken out probably around 14, 15 years old. Can you imagine that? 14, 15 years old and you lose everything you've ever known in your life. <clears throat> your parents are gone. Everybody else is, that, that you ever trusted is gone. And now you're taken out and uh, marched or carried to Babylon. And from that moment forward, they're trying to re-educate you into being who they want you to be. So Daniel and several of his friends that we read about, uh, Hananiah Hananiah and uh, uh, Azariah and uh, Mishael uh, that we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because their names were changed, uh, they... Uh, they come along with Daniel and they're taken out during that time. And then uh, as they're taken into captivity, they are put in a special condition where uh, they are going to be trained and, and taken care of and given all kinds of uh, wonderful food from the king's table and all these things to prepare them to be leaders in Babylon. And they were changing them into Babylonians and not and, and take them totally out of their uh, their understanding and their education that they'd received in Israel and so now Daniel's coming out in a part of all of this group and one of the things we find out about Daniel from the very beginning is he is a person of no compromise he never compromises his faith He is always going to stand up for what he believes. He faithfully lived in a foreign land. Now, what do we know about our existence as Christian believers? What does the New Testament tell us about uh, our destiny and what, what we're about while we're here? When we become Christian believers, do we realize something? We realize that this world is not our home. Isn't that right? So... This, this world we live in today becomes not our home because we've come to the understanding, as God's Word teaches us, that our home is where? Where Jesus is. So 
Well, when we're, wherever Jesus is going to be and we go to be with him, that's where we're going to be forever with the Lord Jesus. And our home is heaven with him and not here just on the earth. So Daniel lived in that kind of reality. He lived in the reality that there was no compromising about his faith. He realized that his destiny was to live for God and of God and not to allow people to change him into something they wanted him to be. So when we read the scripture here tonight, it reminds us of that and reminds us that uh, Daniel and his friends were going to obey the Lord. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And he goes on to tell us about how how just what we were talking about that they looked for men of with no blemish the the, the their idea of a complete uh, young person that they were going to take and easily train to become who they wanted them to be and it says in verse four that young men they were looking for in whom there was no blemish but good looking gifted in all wisdom possessing knowledge and quick to understand who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. In other words, they scored 1,500 on the SAT or whatever the score is now. You know, they were, they were, they were smart young men and they were good looking and they were going to be the, uh, the perfect models to change and paganize. And that's what they, that was their whole desire. So the king, the king appointed for them, verse 5 says, a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, <coughs> from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. To, he gave, now, of course... What happens when you're trying to change somebody over to your way of thinking? Well, you change their name. You change their identity. I mean, isn't that the, isn't that the way, the first way to start making the change of somebody? You change their identity and who they are. And so uh, here they rename them. They call Daniel Belteshazzar, and they call uh, uh, the, uh, one Shadrach and one Meshach and one Abednego. But Daniel, this is verse number 8, that's the central part of our lesson tonight. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and the goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. Now, Understand something, just like we studied about Joseph in the past and how God blessed the work of Joseph's hands and prepared him for his mission, God did the same thing for Daniel. He prepared him to be the leader. He prepared him to have a good relationship with the chief of the eunuchs who was in charge of these young men. And so now God brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said, to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you. And then, so in doing that, Daniel's giving them an option, but he is also requesting, let us, let us see how well we're going to be after 10 days. You judge us in who we are after that. And of course, we know the rest of the story that, that uh, they consented and they didn't eat any of the king's table food, but they ate the vegetables, drank the water, and then in verse 17, it says, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said 
that they should be brought in. The chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Now, isn't that just like God? You know, he, he works through the no compromise attitude of Daniel and his friends, and he blesses their efforts, and he prepares the way for them to be smarter and stronger and uh, more, uh, you know, more noticed by the king than any of the others and ten times better than the rest of them. And that's how God works when we come and we recognize, Lord, you're in charge of my future, you're in charge of my present, you know the things that I need, and you're going to prepare the way for me. And that's exactly what he did for Daniel and the three friends. Now again, I want you to put your mind in theirs for just a moment. These are young guys, 14, 15 years old, taken away from everything they've ever known, taken away from their parents who are most likely all dead by now, and they're brought into this foreign land, but they remain faithful to what they know God's told them to do. I don't know about you, but I feel like in many, t many times uh, in the, 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 the uh, America that I grew up in, I'm in a foreign land compared to that. From when I was growing up, I feel like I'm not in that same country, in that same place, because it has changed so rapidly and not, not for the best. So when we look at this, we can s partly identify with what's going on that Daniel and, and his friends were facing uh, a, a reality that they'd never seen before. But one of the things that's amazing is Daniel kept his life on track. And how did he do that? Well, first of all, by an uncompromising faith. Even though he came from a well-educated, what we would consider a well-to-do family, he had a faith that he had learned and had grown in knowing the scriptures of God. And because of that, he was able to withstand the attacks that would come. The attacks on his identity. The attacks on his uh, lineage and heritage. The attacks on everything that was from the past when the Babylonians wanted to change them all and make them in the future like them. So Daniel had to stand and be uncompromising for exactly what he believed in. We have a word, uh, faith, that we use all the time. There's an acronym I like to use with faith sometimes, and it's called forsaking all, I trust him. When we think about what faith is, we forsake everything else in the world, everything in our culture, everything in the pagan society, and we trust God alone. That's what faith's all about. It's being willing to put everything in, that, that we have uh, in uh, the Lord's hands and realize that God's word matters in our lives. So the more we study God's word and put it in our, uh, ourselves, the, the more we will be like Daniel. How, what did Daniel do? He purposed in his heart, the Bible says, that he would not compromise. He wouldn't sin against God. He wouldn't go against the things he knew were right. What about us? Do we purpose in our heart that we're not going to go against the things of this world? He purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself. In Proverbs uh, 4, verse 23, Scripture says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So if our heart's right before God, then we're more likely going to act in, in the way our heart is before the Lord. Are we pure in our heart, in our mind before God? And have we purposed in our heart that we're not going to defile ourselves by the world? Now, it's real easy to compromise with the world, isn't it? Sure it is. 
we do it in little subtle ways, and then after we've done it for little subtle ways for a while, it's easier to do it in bigger ways. So we have to be careful about our heart and our mind and our spirit and realize like the Babylonians wanted to make a complete change of these young men and make them pagan like themselves. They were, and, and, and even though they were doing that, they thought they were making them better. Do you think uh, people in our world, sometimes they have all these great intentions, they think they're going to make you better by, by immersing you in some of the junk that we hear the education programs uh, are, whether they're in our vocations at work or whether they're in our schools. And sometimes they, they, uh, get, they, they have an intention in their mind that they want to make uh, humankind better. But in reality, they're allowing the compromise of the world to tear down what God's built up. So when we look at Daniel, we see somebody with an uncompromising faith who had been trained in the ways of the Lord and who was going to stand up for what was right. And he was going to stand up for what was right and be bold enough to say, hey, can we try this? And I, I liked his approach. He went to the chief of the eunuchs and said, hey, can we not just eat some vegetables and have some water and, and, and live a, a lifestyle that's more conducive to what we grew up in, can we try this out for the next few days? And I, I love the response of the, the chief of the units. He said, you realize it's my head that we're talking about here. You know, I'm going to be the one that's executed if, uh, if you come out wrong in this. But, but Daniel said, well, just give us 10 days. Just give us a few days. And, of course, we know the story, how it, it became uh, clear, more and more clear that the boys with Daniel are uh, excelling over everybody else. First of all, they had the right God, right? They had the right faith in the right God, and they had the intention of their heart that they were not going to compromise what they knew was right. And that's who we as God's people need to be, that we're not going to compromise in our faith. We're going to allow God's word to become a part of us so that we don't compromise our faith. Second thing we see that kept Daniel's life on track, he has an uncompromising lifestyle. His lifestyle was, was all revolving around his testimony of the Lord. And as he was examined by... Um, the king himself. What did, what did the king see? He saw someone whose faith matched his lifestyle. And, and that's, that's where we need to, or uh, let me turn it around. His lifestyle matched his faith. Many times we talk about having big faith, don't we? We sing about it. We pray about it. We uh, come to Bible study about it. And we talk about the faith that we might have. But yet, when you take that faith, it has to be put into action. That's what we were studying about in the letter of James all this time on Wednesday nights. Taking our faith and putting it into action. This is what we see going on with Daniel and his friends. They are people who <coughs> not only said, we believe, but they gave it their all. And when we read verse 17, it says, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel uh, had under, uh, understanding in all visions and dreams. God gave them gifts that they demonstrated and they used in the, in the reality of learning and growing and being the people that God had called them to be. So no, none of the rest of the students, none of the rest of the young men were found to have that same capability that Daniel and his three friends had. Now, of course, we know when we get into the book of Daniel, we see Daniel and the three friends are tested over and over and over again. We're going to talk about each one of those testing times that they went through, how they were persecuted, how they were, uh, they, people were jealous of the relationship they had with the king. They were jealous of their abilities that God gave them. But yet their lifestyle remained consistent. Well, the greatest 
The greatest thing we can do as God's people is have a consistent lifestyle that matches our faith. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be totally complete at it because we haven't made it to completion and with Jesus forever. But we're striving for our faith and our lifestyle to match up. And when we exercise our gifts in the world and walk through life, we're doing the things that God's called us to do. So Daniel kept his life on track with God by this uncompromising lifestyle. Uh, there's a, uh, Dr. Steve uh, Maraboli said this, most people will talk the talk, few will walk the walk, be amongst those few. We want to be amongst the few that actually walk the walk and we are uh, we're taking everything that God's giving us and we're putting that into action in the world. We have an uncompromising faith, but we also have that uncompromising lifestyle. And lastly, with all this faith and lifestyle, Daniel keeps on track with, an un with uncompromising results. The results, according to uh, what we read here in God's Word, they're ten times better than all the rest. And I really believe when we trust God for our daily life and we trust him also for the results of our lives, that the results are always going to match our faith and our lifestyle when we trust God fully. You know, but, but we have to be willing to trust him with the results. I, I have always had this inner drive inside of me to succeed. And, it, you know, whether it was when I was little in some kind of competition, I always wanted to win it. You know, it, when I was playing uh, football, when I was, you can't even imagine that I played football, but I did. It, when I was playing football growing up, I loved, to, uh, I, I loved to run with the ball, and I loved football until they started catching me. You know, when I, when I got to the point I wasn't fast as everybody else, I said, uh, maybe I can play the trumpet now. I can do something else. But no, you want to do, I, I wanted to be the best at everything I did. And even, even embarrassingly that way, in my own mind and my spirit. And so that drive is there to succeed. And I've told you all that story before. Right before Julie and I launched out to start a brand new church, I had never been so scared in my life. Not that I wouldn't provide for my family. Not that, uh, that we wouldn't get started uh, to, uh, to share the gospel in this place. I was all caught up in whether I would succeed or not. And what, what does success look like to believers? Well, it ought to look like, does God bless do we see God's blessing in our life? Do we see God uh, moving in our life? Do we see God working in our life? That should be our uh, method to look at success. When we think about Daniel, he wasn't sitting around trying to think about, well, uh, how can I be a success? He let the results rest in God. And because he did, God excelled in the results. When you get comments like this from the king, uh, and you recognize that verse 20 is the great commentary over uh, all this after the king's interview of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It says, In all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. So, it doesn't matter how old they were or how experienced they were or how long they had been in Chaldean thought uh, and Babylonian understanding. These four boys outshined everybody else. Why? Because of God's blessing. Because what God did through Daniel to be the witness, the example, the testimony. Now think about that for a moment among us as Christian believers, is our lifestyle and our faith uncompromising enough that we're models to the people around us 
whether it be in our immediate families or among our friends or where we go to school or wherever that might be? Are we models to people around us of folks that are covered in God's blessing and God's success? It doesn't have to look like, we don't have to look like Elon Musk to be successful. We don't have to look like the, the, you know, the most wealthy and prestigious men and women on the planet. We just need to live under God's blessing. And when you live under God's blessing, people notice. Even pagan kings like Nebuchadnezzar noticed. We, know, we noticed the pagan kings of Genesis and, and uh, in Joseph's time. Who noticed? Pharaoh noticed. You see, people notice no matter who they are or what stature they are in the world, when we are blessed by God, and they, you know what the question is in their mind? Why? Why are these people blessed? Why are these people successful in what they do? Well, we have an answer, don't we? And that answer is because of what Christ has done in our life and how we can share with them how the, the blessing that God gives and the blessing that God always provides as he inhabits the praises of his people, the direction of his people, and the uncompromising faith of his people. So when we, just to get this started tonight, and as we'll walk through the story of Daniel over the weeks to come, recognize the fact that a uh, young boy that we would look at today and say, He's 14 years old. How could he do that? Well, the answer is God. That's how God works. He works in Daniel's life, the three friends' life, and throughout their uh, time in Babylon, God used them as living examples of the people that he was going to use in the future for his glory and his honor. The big question for all of us are, is... Uh, are we living in an uncompromising faith? Are we allowing that uncompromising faith to translate into an uncompromising lifestyle? And are we leaving the results to God? And as we answer those questions, God will use us, he will bless us, and he will show us how people can see Jesus through us in this world. Amen? Father, thank you tonight for always being faithful. Thank you for your great love and mercy for us. We thank you for the accounts of people like Daniel who had the whole world ripped away from them, but they didn't crawl in a hole to die. They stood for you, and they stood with that uncompromising faith and that ability to trust you for success. And Father, I pray that you'll help us as your people today to stand for you, to be uncompromising in a world filled with compromise, and that, Father, you'll use us for your glory and your honor in every situation that we're in. And Lord, we know that <laughs> the Bible points out to us it doesn't matter how old we are. It's our understanding that you're in control and that you want to bless and that you want to use us to be a blessing to others. So I pray tonight that you'll take all of us during this week, the people in our, our church family that are away traveling because it's spring break, or the, uh, the, the folks uh, who are busy in all kinds of endeavors tonight, and each one of us who are here, that you'll take us, Lord, and just use us in your world for your glory and for your honor and that we would be those people of faith that wouldn't back down because of fear or because of worry or because of the anxieties of this world but that we would put our full and total trust in you so that as you inhabit the praises of us your people people will hear and see the testimony all around us Thank you for what you're going to do and bless our time as we gather to pray, as we gather to worship you, that we'll be in your uh, uh, presence in everything and we'll recognize, Lord, how you want to 
Keep our heart's purpose pure like you kept Daniel's. We love you and praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Brother Phil, Lewis.